Frank Schaefer joins us. He has a new book. Please buy it. It's called Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. Please welcome one of the most requested guests on The David Feldman Show, Frank Schaefer. David, it's nice to be with you again. Uh, you're talking over the fake applause. That's okay. Oh. Hey, you know. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk to you about fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy. I'd like to reintroduce you to the listeners because sure. there are a lot of people who absolutely love and adore you. But there, believe it or not, there are people who have no idea who you are. So we only have 27 more minutes. Let's spend five minutes discussing a little bit about your background, because it gives us so much insight into how big a fraudulent empire, hmm. uh, I hate to say this, but uh, the evangelical movement has turned out to be. Is that unfair for me to say that? No, I think actually it's mild because, you know, fraudulent <laughs> empire is a, a very kind way to describe what actually now is a white supremacist movement that has become a cult following uh, a real con artist, uh, not used as a sort of exaggerated pejorative, but someone who knows they are conning people, which of course is Donald Trump. And now we get into the big lie and so forth. You know, if you had asked me 15 years ago or so when my memoir, Crazy for God was published, what would be happening now? I would say, well, you know, that book will be forgotten. Uh, the evangelical right is basically fading away, old white people about my age being replaced by a much more diverse population that is going to elect liberal legislative people in all branches of government, probably democratic presidents. And this whole story that goes back to my father, Francis Schaeffer in the 1970s and 80s, who along with Sievert Koop and Ronald Reagan and others turned to the evangelicals and turned them using the anti-abortion movement into a radicalized group of people that used a series of social war kind of litmus tests, I never would have predicted that it would result in the presidency of Donald Trump on one hand, and that we now would be battling against about a third of the US population that no longer even believes in or supports our electoral process, but instead is calling for authoritarian government, and if need be, the overthrowing of elected people um, through the claim that somehow the only people who can win legitimately are Republicans. And, and I, I would not have believed that the evangelical movement would so bastardize itself, even if you take what they believe at face value, that we would wind up now with a personality cult having essentially replaced the largest strain of American Christianity that goes back to the founding of our country in the Bay State colony that I'm sitting in here in Massachusetts. And so my own story being Francis Schaeffer's nepotistic sidekick in the 1970s and 80s as a young, ambitious, greedy person who enjoyed access to power, the paycheck I was getting from people like Richard DeVos, who financed our movies, and then his uh, family, you know, winds up very close to the Trump administration and so forth and so on. That's Ian and Eric Prince. Yeah, and Eric Prince and Blackwater and so on. These are the people I was palling around with. Uh, I, I was flying around the country in Jerry Falwell's jet, the founder of the Moral Majority, whose son then, Jerry Falwell Jr., until he was thrown out um, recently, was running Liberty University. These were the people I knew. And so my own journey that I've talked about in my memoirs, like Crazy for God and other books, and basically also the first part of Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, I reprise that in the opening of that book, because obviously the context in which I've got a book coming out actually comes out November 2nd. But the context in which I write that is someone who spent the first part of their life selling fake family values and creating the culture war we're in now. And so I'm pushing 70 years old and I've spent the last 40 years essentially talking against what I spent my youth pushing. And I know this is hyperbolic and, and a little crazy to say, but I'm in the same position that someone was who, for instance, maybe as a young person in Germany, was in Hitler Youth. And after the war, they said, my God, what have I done? 
and spend a long time trying to make reparations. Well, is now, it after, not quite that we, crazy, it, it, but it's close to it. Is is it after the war or, or are we still in the war? It oh, seems. we're in the war. I mean, this is, you know, if you want to take it back to the Weimar Republic, you know, in, in the U.S. right now, what we're fi- facing is essentially what the Germans faced in, say, 1937, 1938. We're on the cusp of a series of coups. If, you know, the storming of the Capitol was nothing. It was a, it was a little blip. The, the real story is not only voter suppression, but that Republican legislative bodies all over the country now are pushing to not only rescind the election by trying to cancel everything that President Biden is doing, but go further than that and set up a system now in which all red states have a system in their legislative body that they can roll back an election result they don't like on the basis of calling it falsified or fake or whatever. So the big lie now that Donald Trump has been telling is being institutionalized and made a permanent feature of Republican politics. This is a far bigger story than storming of the Capitol, because if this takes place, it means that every election for the rest of your and my lifetime, unfortunately, and a lot of younger people too, will not only be contested, but in a lot of states will actually be rolled back in exactly the same way, for instance, that Roe v. Wade and the constitutional right to an abortion that women have is being rolled back state by state. So there's going to be two countries and there's going to be the red state country that uh, oppresses women, gay people, trans people. There's going to be the blue state country that has its canceled election results thrown in its face every time that it has a victory. How this all ends, we don't know, but it's certainly nothing to do with the American democracy that both the left and the right back in my day as a young activist sort of counted on. That was always going to be there. You know, we fought our battles. End of the day, you accepted the result. You went on. Some lies were told. There was pushing and shoving. Money was spent. But you both, all sides kind of honored that basic system. And now that is gone. And I never could have predicted that. So that's the framework from which I've been writing. And I've been, you know, blogging and doing podcasting and all the rest of it. It's essentially to say, look, this isn't a blip. This is the rest of American history in most people's lifetimes, unless there's a radical change coming from the Democratic Party, which essentially does what needs to be done, not to defeat Republicans, but to defeat a kind of a white nationalism that is in its essence a fascist movement that no longer uses the levers of democracy or even believes in them. So if you had told my dad, Dr. Francis Schaeffer, who wrote these books, like How Should We Then Live and Whatever Happened to the Human Race, that his son, uh, who's his sidekick, would live to see a day in which the very issue of democracy was now up for grabs, he wouldn't have believed you, nor would have Jerry Falwell Sr. In other words, they still were playing by a kind of a basic rule. What they didn't understand was that the culture war they started was going to undo it in its totality. And I never could have foreseen that. And thank God I left much earlier than that. So I've been, I think, on the right side of history for a while. But that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be on the winning side, because the way things are going is a real toss up right now. At least that's the way I see it. We're talking with Frank Schaefer. He's the author of the new book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet well, and Be Happy. Yeah. Um, and you are on a, your own spiritual journey and... Well, I want to talk about the book in a second, but we try to compartmentalize what's going on and separate yeah. the players so that Donald Trump is really just a grifter who's using the evangelical movement to get out of debt. And that's the only reason sure, sure. he's president. And then we look at somebody like Kenneth Starr, who is getting behind the Mike Pence train yeah, for yeah. president. And we look at Ken Starr and we say, okay, he's Torquemada. He's part of the evangelical right, that he is the face yeah, yeah. of the hypocrisy on the evangelical right. And he's a true believer. Mm. Is it fair to say somebody like Ken Starr Brett Kavanaugh, who's a Catholic, yeah, is yeah. a true believer. They believe that church separation, church and state is bogus. 
They believe that white people are entitled to the Supreme Court. They believe that the laws don't apply to them, especially mm -hmm. Christian laws. We've discovered that Ken Starr carried on an affair with this, uh, this Hirschman associate. Mm -hmm. He lies. He defends uh, uh, child abusers like Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah. Yeah. So Donald Trump, we know, is not a true believer. He's a grifter. Right, right. Ken Starr, what is he? You know, you I know, think that the question has got to be this, and that is, do we look at this as a movement, the evangelical white movement in America now, as a group of naive, easily deluded people who have somehow been fooled into following people like Ken Starr, Donald Trump, and these others? Or do we rather see a very different kind of leadership emerging there in someone like Amy Coney Barrett, who... Uh, was not fooled by anybody, but played a very long game going all the way back into the Federalist Society, which my father helped found. Because in the 1980s, he was going around telling law students and other students, don't become preachers, don't become missionaries. We are in this for the long haul, become a, become a lawyer, become a judge, we need to take the courts back. You know, so really you have, you have three kinds of people. You have the, 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 the true believer followers of the Donald Trump cult and the MAGA movement and so forth and so on. You have a group of opportunist operators who are both greedy and at the same time, perhaps true believers or were at one point, the Kenneth Stars of this world, the Mike Pence's would be another. Mike Pence uh, is a true believer. Yeah, and he, whatever he is tonight, yeah, I don't know, but he, at some point he was. And, and that would go for the Michelle Bachmans and these other people. Michelle Bachman, by the way, got into politics because of my father. She read his book, A Christian Manifesto. And she went to Oral Roberts Law School. Yeah, at Oral Roberts Law School. And on the story goes. But the fact is, there's an undercurrent of something completely different going on. There's a group of people in America that go back to people like my dad and Rusesh Rushduni and others in something called the Theonomous Movement or Reconstructionists who really believe that America was put here on earth to be the, the new Israel, as they would see it. They're also Christian Zionists, by the way, so it's sort of an odd thing. But, and that the calling of, quote, real Christians in the States is essentially to do exactly what the true believers in Iran did when they brought the Ayatollah Khomeini back from Paris to overthrow the Shah and establish a true Islamic theocracy, as they saw it. Now, they're not, there's no... Sh equivalent of the Ayatollah sitting somewhere, although a guy like Ralph Reed and Franklin Graham Jr. act like it sometimes, but there is an ideology that is real. It's not a conspiracy. This is not some version of QAnon. It's nothing like this. It's an intellectual construct that says the Old Testament is history. The New Testament is nice, but the only way that we're going to establish Christ's reign on earth is to get us back to keeping the law as written in the Old Testament and that we need to bring America back to its Christian foundation. Now, most historians agree that that foundation was a mixed bag. There were some, some Christians involved that would be recognized as such by evangelicals, but most were either deists or enlightenment people and others. So that's real history. But in the ideology of the Reconstructionist movement that has been behind this whole thing and has, for instance, Mike Pence as a disciple, mm -hmm. uh, You've got a completely different theology and philosophy, and that is that America is just a stepping stone to God doing his will on earth. The return of Israel to Palestine would be one thing. Jerusalem being, being the capital, a greater Israel expanding out to the Tigris and Euphrates so that Jesus can come back and find it all in place. These are true believers, but they're, they also believe in theocracy. They do not believe in democracy. And if you get to people like Rusesh Rushduni, he was a white nationalist. He, he, he defended slavery. He believed that women should not work outside the home. He called even daycare a form of infanticide. These are very radical people. They are not household names in the U.S. They did not run a conspiracy. But what they did is they influenced a whole group of evangelical leaders. And eventually people like Amy Coney Barrett came out of organizations that were very oppressive to women and we're very much in line with this way of thinking that we are taking America back. And they played a very long game, whereas the left just sort of staggered from election to election. They did not have the same kind of think tank people. They did not have the same kind of organization. And when it got to people like the Koch brothers and others or the DeVosses that were financing us, they were not financing us because they were true believers or converted. They saw evangelicals as a tool 
to keep far right politicians in power. We were the useful idiots, but the useful idiots took over the asylum and now they now run it. So the reason Donald Trump was president was not because of Vladimir Putin or Facebook or all these other nefarious players, stupid as they've been, or in the case of Facebook, not Putin who got what he wanted. He only became president for one reason, and that is Ralph Reed, Franklin Gam, and other evangelical leaders came to him and said, look, you do not have a ground game. We do. Hillary Clinton has a ground game. You don't. We have a ground game, and it's called 25, 30,000 evangelical churches, crisis pregnancy says and others, and we can put people on the street for you, and we can help you. And But here's what we want in return. When you appoint a judge, we want it off this list. And when you get into power, we want the embassy back in Jerusalem. They gave him a sort of a theocratic wish list. And he didn't deliver for many people except a few billionaire buddies, but he sure delivered for this group. And he's still delivering for them by denying the election result. So their prophetic voices that predicted he would still be president would not be contradicted. People don't understand that. He's still doing what the religious right told him. They said, look, God has put you in charge. God doesn't make mistakes. Obviously, therefore, you must have won the election. This is, a, this is not a political statement. It's a theological statement. And until the media begins to understand that you can't understand the Trump presidency or the big lie or any of this, when you take it out of the theological framework of these evangelical far right winger folks and the folks that influence them, it's inexplicable. So they go back and they say, well, it's Appalachia or it's the Rust Belt or it's this or that or the other. Let's talk about anything except the fact that there is a strong theocracy movement in America, that there are some people involved in it who really understand it. There's a lot of camp followers who are just pushed by resentment and anger and Fox News and stir the pot. But there always has been a core of conservative Roman Catholics and, and white evangelical Christians who have had an agenda that they have pursued without any interruption for 40, 45 years. And, and, and the kind of big parting of the, the, the ways and where they found their energy was when Roe v. Wade became a big issue and the anti-abortion movement. And I'll add one little thing that a lot of people don't know, but I was there, okay? So this is now not me reading somewhere. I was in the meeting. Take, for instance, the meeting my dad had three times with Reverend Billy Graham, the big evangelist, when we were making our pro-life anti-abortion movie series, Whatever Happened to the Human Race with C. Everett Koop. We begged Billy to get on board with us and become a pro-life activist along with us. He point blank refused because he was pro-choice. So was Dr. Criswell, president of the Southern Baptist Convention, point blank refused. He had been on our platform with us in Dallas when we did a seminar for 25,000 people for our previous film series, How Should We Then Live? He refused to appear with us with whatever happened to the human race. So most people don't even understand how the first job of folks like dad and Rush Dooney and me in those days was not to turn the culture war red hot with the left and the liberals. It was to first radicalize a spiritual movement called evangelicalism, which at that point was voting just about equally Democrat or Republican. They had not been commandeered into one movement. And so people like Paul Weirich and other conservative Roman Catholic operators saw that we were bringing them a gift. And that is if we could talk to enough evangelicals and radicalize them to the extent that at that point, only a small group of far right Roman Catholics were that radical, people like the Knights of Columbus and so forth, that we would give them an opportunity that they could never generate by themselves. And that is exactly what we did. And so when we started working with Jock Kemp, the congressman who became Bob Dole's vice presidential candidate, when people like Michelle Bachman heard my dad and got into politics because of that, we were bringing a, something new to the table. And that was we were, we were jumping what had just been a culture war up into something different. And that was a war to quote, bring America back to God on a theocratic model that actually, even when you go to the Bay State colony, it had never been that. It was a far more right-wing experiment in religiosity and the merger of government and church than had been tried even in the original colonies. So I don't think that most folks understand that our first job was to radicalize the evangelical movement and we succeeded. And out of that came a completely different kind of politics that people like the Koch brothers and others and were able to manipulate. 
And then it got out of control even for them. So essentially, it's very much like the Weimar Republic, where you had these radicalized groups, and then suddenly the National Socialists and the fascists emerge, and they begin to shock the business world that thought that they could be used. Right. And all of a sudden, the table has been turned, and now it is people like Ralph Reed and Franklin Graham. They're not being used anymore by Republican leaders. It is the Republicans who are the lick spittle servants now of the radicalized far-right evangelicals. And everything they're doing in supporting the big lie that they know is not true, they are doing to keep these people happy and on board. And there's no limit to how far they will go. So that, that's the situation we're in tonight. And my family played a huge part of it. And I've written about it. And I've tried to talk about it. But um, and as I say, I launched my new book with a reprise of this journey, then offering a, a very different take on the fake family values we were selling back in the day saying, look, you know, there's a completely science-based way of seeing reality and it has nothing to do with the way what we were pitching back in those days. You became an atheist? I'm not. I describe myself as an atheist who believes in God. And I know that's an oxymoron, but I do that because I believe in, in, in paradox. And people say to me, well, do you still pray? And I say, yes, I do. Well, do you believe you're being heard by God? I have no idea. I probably don't. So why do you do that? Because I was raised psychologically in a certain way. And, um, you know, if you got a problem with that, well, everybody brings to the table how they were raised. So, yes, intellectually speaking, I am an atheist. I believe that, you know, when I pass away, lights out, it's over and so forth and so on. Nevertheless, when I get up tomorrow morning, I'll pray for my kids and my grandchildren and in, in exactly the same way that uh, I do a lot of other illogical things that are based on my own emotional fabric that was designed a certain way. Look, you can't be conditioned from birth in the evangelical community and homeschooled and walk away scot-free, free thinking as if you just were starting from zero. Okay, the name of your book, your new book, is Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. I would say four-fifths of those commandments would be followed by the... Uh, people who believe in a theocracy. Yes, Fall they would. Up, have children. That's almost politically incorrect. Yes, Stay yes. put. Uh, I could, you know, don't, uh, don't leave. Uh, you know, enjoy your position in life and yeah. be happy, all that. Save the planet. Where do the, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy wrote the first uh Book I read about how the evangelical Christians, people like Gail Norton and the Coors sure. family. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if they're evangelicals, but Bobby Kennedy Jr. before he became an anti-vaxer, wrote a book warning of these far-right. Can I call them fundamentalists? Yeah. Believe that the earth is ours to devour, yeah. and when it gets destroyed, that's going to hasten the second coming. Yeah. And it's just uh, it really out to lunch. You know, when you look at the title, fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy. It's deliberately provocative. And basically what I'm doing and saying, look, I have written a progressive book that is probably the most pro-feminist book you will read in a long time. I talk about parenthood and even motherhood in terms that apply just as equally to a single gay man or a trans person or a non-binary person with no children as they do to any biological mother. In fact, what I'm doing is I'm saying all these things that look like traditional family values have a root, not in evangelical Christianity or any kind of religion, but in evolution itself. For instance, the, re the reason why we are the way we are, weird things, is that all, all females give birth to premature babies when it com is compared to other primates. And so there's a much longer childhood development, out of which comes the need for community, out of which needs come the very fact that that old saying that it takes a village is true, out of which comes the need to have connection to other people. We have a whole biological and chemical process in our brain that means that a, a gay adoptive parent who takes a child into their home and pays attention to them has the same chemical biological reactions that can be tracked by science as a mother of a newborn child biologically. So actually fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy, applies just as much to anyone who has this set of priorities. And this is what the book's really about. 
are we about our job? Are you defined by the economic power status that a, that a capitalist society is giving you? Are you what you do? Or are you the quality of all your interpersonal connections and community? And if you are, we're going to be able to save the planet. But if it's all about gross national product and growing the economy, we are completely doomed. <clears throat> and so really what this book is, is saying, look, you want real traditional family values, real traditional family values. You want real connection. They are not found in, quote unquote, just in traditional relationships or whatever it may be. They are found in actually the prime directive of evolution itself. And the big switch has come that in the last few years, we've gone from believing this idea of the selfish gene, that altruism and goodness and care and community is just sort of this window dressing to our genetic survival, to a completely different view that is coming now from biology and, 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 and all the rest of it. And that is that it's really boils down to the survival of the friendliest. Can we cooperate? So the real answer to American fascism and capitalism is not uh, to push things further out somehow into some unexplored territory. It's to remind people who we really are. We are semi-evolved primates who do better when we cooperate in community and see all of our activities as parenting of those around us from birth to death, or we are just alone individual folks who believe in this crazy idea of gross national product combined with a kind of an Ayn Rand view of the life that gives primacy to powerful males, lording it over everybody else and accumulating wealth, building their own rocket ships and going off into space when they can't even pay people decently who work for them and so on. So this book is a real challenge to myself in having pitched fake family values through those years and to my readers and to others who have followed me saying, look, you know, after <laughs> spending five years of reading some biology and psychology, what I have discovered is, is that the best aspects of human life can root back to biology, not to religion. And if you want to be happy, let's start by recognizing who we are. And that is we are communitarian creatures who need each other, not a bunch of libertarian, selfish pricks who are starting multi-billion dollar corporations. If you think that's what success is, read my book, you'll change your mind. That's what the book is about. And I throw out a deliberately conservative title to, as it were, annoy people into reading it. To my listeners, I don't ask you for much. I really don't. Please go out and buy this man's book. Please. Uh, it, he's one of the most important guests we've ever had on the show. One of the most requested guests we've, we've ever had on this show. And I, I ask all of you to go by Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. I'm going to just be honest. If we can sell books on this show... Frank Schaefer is a very busy man. He'll come back. I will indeed. And you know yeah, what? We have don't... to buy the book. Let me hang on, Frank. Let me just yeah. say <laughs> if you want him to come back, buy the book. Fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy. Go buy this book, buy several books, and give them out as gifts. We've got David Cobb coming up. He ran for president on the Greed Party ticket and he was Ralph Nader's campaign manager in Texas. And we're going to talk about whatever is on David Cobb's mind. To segue into David Cobb, Frank Schaefer, author of Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy. We know who we're up against. But who are we? Who am I? Yeah, what, yeah. what is my singular focus? How do you beat somebody who has a singular focus? These people wake up every morning and they say, I want a theocracy. I want Jesus to come back. And the only way that's going to happen is if we install this guy as a leader. Or I want money and I will say and do anything. In fact, co-opt the Christian evangelicals. Mm as my army so I don't have to pay taxes. All I want is money. They know what the, you cannot defeat people who have a singular purpose. Mm -hmm. What is my singular purpose? What is your singular purpose? And 
do enough people have the same singular purpose to defeat a small sector of our society? You know, Christian evangel right wing Christian evangelicals, that's that number is going down. Fewer and fewer people, right, Frank? Identify. Yeah, it is going down, but, but that, is why, is that is why they are trying. One percent. That's Nader right. says you need one percent who want something really badly yeah. in this country, and they will get it. So who we, are we? Listen, you and I have lived long enough that we live for a long time of our lives through the apartheid state in South Africa, where a few million whites controlled tens of millions of black people. So we've seen how this works. And, and the very fact that there are less evangelical white nationalists than there are other folks means nothing if they end run the whole system, change the laws in the state houses that they can deny election results combined with rejecting every election in which they lose as false or fake. Who thought we would get there? But we are there. So the very fact that the numbers aren't in their favor, maybe in the long, long term after we're long gone, favor a more rational, better approach. But for the short, long term, you know, the lifetimes of anybody listening to this program, the danger is we're no longer going to be in a real democracy. And theocracies don't run with popular support. Look at how the Iranian people have to tried numerous times to throw off the yoke of oppression they face from their theocrats. They haven't managed to do it. Once these systems are entrenched, it's very, very hard to overthrow them. And uh, it's a long, long way. So we've got to fight now like hell to stop this from going any further and to, to do what we can to, in, as, as you put it, to very single-mindedly realize that whatever else is going on, whatever we agree and disagree on, we have to unite against this movement towards theocracy by these white nationalist evangelical Christians with their, with their conservative Roman Catholic fellow travelers. And it's a huge, it's a huge challenge facing us. Who would have thunk it? But we're, we are really here. Great. Uh, thank you, Howie Klein, for introducing us to Frank Schaefer. Howie Klein is batting a thousand percent. Every thank guest, you, you. He, and okay, listen to me. Frank Schaefer is one of the most requested guests on my show. It's been, I think, two years since you were on. Go by, fall in love, have children, stay put, save the planet, be happy. Buy the book. He'll come back if you buy the book. This is America. There's some, unfortunately, it's transactional. Unfortunately. Uh, thank you, Frank Schaefer. Hey, thanks a lot. It is an honor. Soon. It is Frank, an honor. Oh, this David is David Cobb's Cobb's question. Question. Yeah, but before you leave, I just got to say, uh, I did not know your work before this uh, interview. Yeah. I am so inspired by what I heard you say. I want to uh, own I. I grew up as a little boy uh, and self-identified as a soldier for Christ. My grandfather was a Baptist preacher. I was a believer. Mm -hmm. um, and I still remember uh, at uh, eight years old, nine years old, uh, at a, uh, I had just come out of vacation Bible school where we literally did the Good Samaritan on the felt. Um, remember those, right? So yeah, absolutely. The, yes, I do. And uh, we were having uh, a, a, a potluck afterwards and a, a, a black person who I now recognize to be homeless uh, or probably, but destitute came up uh, and the deacons did not throw rocks at him and run him off. But what I still remember was they surrounded him. They let him come through and get a plate of food. And then they ushered him away. Mm. And Frank, that was the moment that I said, we're fucking liars. Yeah. We are hypocrites. We don't believe in the teachings of Christ. We don't do it. And so when I read your Wikipedia and see you describe yourself as a Christian atheist, I just want to say, I want to know you better. I want to get to know you because that's how I, I still believe in the teachings of Christ and the generosity and the compassion and mm. the connection and everything that that represented, I'm now realizing that that can be found in every one of the world's great religions. Mm. So it's not unique to Christianity. What is unique, however, is the ability for us to recognize the connection to each other, to the natural world, and that that is the winning narrative. And yeah. 
I know that you have to go or you can stay on for my entire segment. No, no, I, this is your, this is your segment, but listen, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I never have any hesitancy in giving out my email address because I've got so many people who already bombard me with trolling and all, all foreign. So let me give out my email address slowly here for you, David. And if other people pick up on it, um, it's just my name. Hang, with hang, the middle hang, initial hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. We're, we're, we're live. I will send out a group email. Sure. And yeah. just let them know my email, please. Yeah. And we'll, and David, let's get in touch with each other and keep talking. And, um, yes, you know, all, all, to all of you. Okay. So listen, thank you so much. And that was lovely, lovely to have you jump in there at the end of my segment and the beginning of yours. Nice, nice segue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Howie Klein. Thank you. Yes. Thank thanks, you. Howie. Always. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Harvey Joe Clay. Oh.